Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Anna, and I'm with the New Mexico Small Business Development Center. Today, we have Amanda Davis joining us, who is a certified SCORE mentor, holds a bachelor's degree of business accounting and business administration in accounting, and is the founder and owner of a business consulting and bookkeeping firm here in New Mexico. Amanda has guided many small businesses, creative professionals, and nonprofit organizations towards financial clarity and will be presenting basic bookkeeping. If you wouldn't mind progressing to the next slide, Amanda, that would be great. We will be using the Q&A function to take questions and welcome attendee participation. So don't hesitate to ask us any questions you may have. We'll answer those questions at the end of the webinar. Definitely don't be shy about asking us questions. We love them. So um, send them through to us. And then the following slide features some COVID-19 business resource links which I won't go over in detail as we'll send you a copy of the presentation at the end of the webinar. And then lastly, please visit our website at nmsbdc.org to view our upcoming no-cost webinars or to sign up for our no-cost counseling services. I will also send a follow-up email to you with this information. Thanks so much for joining us. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Amanda. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for taking some time out of your day to um, nerd out with me about bookkeeping. Um, this outline is just kind of giving you an idea of what we're going to go through, um, why you need to bookkeep, the basic principles and practices, financial statements, ratios, uh, mistakes to avoid, terminology, and reports. So we're going to go through all of that. And hopefully by the end of this session, you will be able to understand the process and purpose of bookkeeping, why it's important, um, the terminology, uh, at least a basic level where you've seen it before. We're going to do a lot of repetition with um, some of these terms. So bear with us if uh, they are not new to you and this is old information, um, but we have designed this to be a very basic introductory course. So we like to do some repetition so that hopefully you hear that here, here at the next time after this course, you're gonna be familiar with it. Um, understanding basic financial statements and basic financial ratios. So fun story, story time with nerd. Um, accounting, uh, we're gonna be going over the history of bookkeeping and the common bookkeeping mistakes. And so when I was researching for uh, this presentation, I found out that bookkeeping was established in the late 15th century by a mathematician and a monk. And in the book where the monk wrote, uh, he described the double entry bookkeeping system. Um, even though a lot has changed since the 15th century, not a lot of the basics about bookkeeping has changed, in the, uh, but the way that you do the bookkeeping now is different. So before they used to have paper, they had a physical journal where you would put in the details and then the ledger where you would add up all the uh, transactions into their categories. And then the books at the end of the month would, um, would be reconciled between the ledger and the journal. And that is known as a trial balance, which is done before financial statements can be prepared. Well, now we have accounting software. So there's no paper journal that you're writing in. Um, there's software similar to um, QuickBooks. They have QuickBooks online. They have different kinds. They have Xero. They have all of these other solutions for accounting software. And some of that builds into um, optical character recognition where it can actually read data and um, create some of the data entry um, banking feeds where stuff that comes in from your bank, um, it reduces the amount of, of time that you have to spend doing data entry, which then eliminates um, some human errors. You can create rules around it and you can capture images for like receipt documentation, that kind of fun stuff. Um, so, between accounting versus bookkeeping. So bookkeeping is record keeping and data management. So there's a few things about um, retention. Um, the three-year rule would be for general correspondence, employment applications. And if you get to the point where you're so big that you need internal audit reports, uh, you, would, you would maintain those for three years. Seven years, bank statements, canceled checks, uh, contracts, leases, expense reports, invoices to customers, invoices from vendors, um, personal records, timesheets, and sales records. 
Um, the one thing in here you may or may not be familiar with is canceled checks, and that's when you physically write a check and somebody goes and cashes it at their bank, then that um, check is then canceled and returned, and many people would um, get those copies of those physical canceled checks back um, as, as part of an internal control, but also as a record keeping process. Um, very few of that happens uh, nowadays and with all the different electronic payment forms, but it is an option. Um, okay, so permanent is tax returns and work papers to create your, your tax returns. Um, you hear the three year and the seven year rule around taxes and, and the answer is the IRS can ask you for anything for however long they need to if they have basis to do so. So it's just a good idea to maintain those records. And with the, the cybersecurity and all that technology, it's just a, a good idea to keep uh, duplicated records, meaning you have something in digital form and paper form, or if it's only digital, it's in more than one location in case any one location is compromised. Okay, accounting uses the data that is summarized by bookkeeping um, to create, um, to summarize a business's financial position and render tax uh, financial advice, prepare tax returns, um, do auditing services, uh, maybe prepare certified financial statements for lenders, buyers, and investors, um, common bookkeeping tasks, data entry, some office management, administrative stuff, customer billing, paying bills, payroll, um, in a period closing, reconciling accounts, making adjusting journal entries, reviewing the financial statements to make sure they're accurate, and then maybe locking the period so it cannot be altered after it is finalized. Um, and then there's the internal uh, management reports and internal means you're not giving it to somebody else to lend you money or make decisions on your business, like an investor or whatnot. These are just uh, general stuff that you would use for the day to day management. So um, your balance sheet, your income statement, your cash flow statement, accounts receivable and accounts payable, aging reports. And now on to common mistakes. So the SBA has a statistic that half of new businesses fail within five years, largely due to poor financial management. Um, so if you do your bookkeeping and you're paying attention to it, then whatever could be causing your business to fail could easily be identified and adjusted. So that is one reason why you would want to do it, because your, your numbers are going to tell you, I guarantee you. Um, <clears throat> having the wrong accounting method. There's two different kinds of uh, ways that you can record things. One is on a cash basis, one is on a accrual basis. We will go over that terminology a little bit later. Um, here's my pet peeve, intermingling personal and business finances and transactions. So if you have one bank account and you run everything through it, um, first of all, it is a nightmare to sort that show out. So please um, have a separate uh, account, even if it's not in the business's name, just have everything separated because it will, uh, it, it's going to be a problem to say, okay, well, I went to this meal, but was this meal for business or personal? Well, how would you know? Because it's the same account. Um, the, the biggest problem with that is, is liability. So if somebody were to decide to sue you for everything you've ever owned, um, then that person may have a legal standing to take your personal house your personal car, literally the shirt off your back, if they can prove that you weren't treating the business separate from uh, yourself personally. So if, if they can make the link and, and the legal term or the uh, technical business term is called piercing the corporate veil. So as soon as they can prove that you aren't treating the business separate, um, then they don't have to treat it separate when they're coming after you. So that's a liability issue. Um, if I haven't terrified you enough, please don't do it. Okay, uh, misclassifying workers. This is another costly error. If you um, identify uh, people that help you, that you hire to come work at your company, if you identify employees as contractors, um, there could be a, a legitimate case. And if the Department of Labor decides that no, these are in fact employees and there's standards and tests and rules around that. So if you identify an employee as a contractor, then they can go back after you for um, payroll taxes and penalties and interest and late filing, late penalties, late payments, all of this stuff. So um, that can actually be a problem. Um, some uh, people don't reconcile their bank account. That's one thing I get all the time when I'm doing training on QuickBooks. So why do I have to reconcile? I can see the balance and it ties. And the answer is, 
I've had clients who've had fraud committed, who've had um, things kind of happen that's wonky that can actually create problems. And because they're not paying attention to the day and day, because they're not going in and reconciling it, um, there's, there's issues. Another thing is um, it's, it helps you easily identify mistakes, duplications, and um, omissions, frankly. So you want to reconcile. It's the first, uh, first area of control that you have. Um, talk about controls, lack of controls. Um, I've had a large contracting company in the state of New Mexico, and they didn't have their physical checks that they write uh, payments to vendors. They were actually doing physical checks, and they print them off of a, a computer printer. And so they had a huge number of checks. And so somebody came in and physically took some checks out of the middle of the stack, and they didn't realize that the um, checks were missing until a very long time later, and checks have been cleared and fraud has been taken against you. So, um, you know, if, if you have a physical asset, you need to put, provide security and barriers. If you have a, um, a different type of asset that, uh, that needs to be reviewed and, and uh, looked over. So putting the, the type of controls in place where people cannot take advantage of you um, and, and you're going to be looking at things. Um, misunderstanding profits versus cash. This one's common because the way the human brain thinks, they look at the bank at the end of the day and they're like, well, that's how much money I make because that's how much money I have. <laughs> you know, that's very logical. But um, what your cash balance is and what your profit is, is a completely different story. And one example of that is, yes, you have this money at the end of the year, right? But then you may have a tax bill that's due uh, whenever you do your taxes several months down the road. So um, that money may not be yours. <laughs> and so understanding where the profit is, and what, what that's based off of, and things that kind of impact that, like your taxable income, would be based uh, starting upon book profit, that kind of stuff. Okay, DIY bookkeeping. And I am a proponent of doing it yourself. I love people to know what's going on with their books. I like people to have a certain understanding of the mechanics behind it, what goes into it. Um, but at the end of the day, if you're doing it yourself and you're not doing it right, you're not doing your bank reconciliations, you're waiting until the end of the year to record everything. Um, if you're not paying attention to certain things, you're duplicating or omitting, you're making errors. There's so many things that could go wrong. So with the DIY bookkeeping, it would be good to have um, somebody who understands what, what those reports are or, or get yourself the education so that when you're doing it yourself, you're doing it correctly. I mean, you don't have to be perfect. Nobody's perfect. It's okay. Um, but, but they need to be um, books that, that you can utilize and are useful. Um, having no record keeping, that's a problem. There's a lot of businesses that don't actually do anything in terms of record keeping. And then they're surprised when they can't get a PPP loan because they haven't done their books because all they have is a pile of paper of receipts and stuff like that. Um, insufficient checks and balances controls. We talked about that. And lack of audit trail, meaning if you need to go figure out what happened to something, um, you need to have a way of figuring out what happened. So you need to have some sort of record to figure out and how to get back to. I call it uh, breadcrumbs. Like I like to leave breadcrumbs. Okay. And that was this one, top uh, mistakes and how to avoid them. Okay, terminology. So you guys are going to get the slide. And I intentionally... I'm, I'm not a jerk. I promise I did this for a reason. I intentionally didn't put the definitions. First of all, that is way too much information to put in the slides. And this would be a very long um, PowerPoint. Instead, I want you guys to have these, um, these terms and then to be able to hear them and eventually go back and look them up, look up their meaning later. So um, these are Google knows the answer. It's cool. You can go look at these in a lot of different places. So um, the accounting equation, we're going to talk about this a lot. Um, the accounting equation is basically assets equals liabilities plus shareholders equity. So when it's called, uh, the financial report is called a balance sheet, and you're like, well, that's a cute little name. Thank you for um, doing that. Why do you call it a balance sheet? And it's because it balances. And a balance sheet has three parts. They have assets, liabilities, and equity. So if the total assets equals the total liabilities plus shareholders equity, boom, you balance and that's the balance sheet. Moving on, we talked about the different basis, cash or accrual. Cash basis is something you're very familiar with. Did the cash leave the bank account? Then you have a transaction to record it. Did the cash come in the bank account? Then you record it and that's when it happens. But let's say you have a credit card 
and you recorded, um, you paid for, I don't know, airfare and travel, and but you're not paying the credit card yet, so you haven't incurred that payment. Um, now, that's not a great example, but you guys are familiar with how that works. You charge something and you pay it later. Um, so this is kind of that thing where you incurred an expense or you earned um, income, but it hasn't either come in yet. So you've sent an invoice to give people to pay you by a certain amount of time. Well, because that invoice was created and earned, then um, that's when you would go in and record um, on an accrual basis because you have earned the revenue, the money is owed to you. You just haven't received it yet on a cash basis. You wouldn't receive, um, you wouldn't record that revenue until cash hits the bank. Somebody's paid you. Okay, assets. So if you close your company, assets are things that would make you money. So if you close the business and you have a bank account, there'll be cash in the bank account. You can take that out. Um, you may own things like buildings, vehicles, um, a patent, um, any kind of receivables that's owed to you. So if, if you were to close out, those assets can get you money. So that's what an asset is. Um, an accounting period, the length of time it takes to complete an accounting cycle. Accounts receivable, that's money that is owed to the business. It is also in the asset um, area. Accounts payable, exactly the opposite. You owe somebody money. Accounts receivable, somebody owes you. Accounts payable, you owe somebody. And it's the same thing both ways. And accounts payable is a liability because it's money that you have to pay, not money you get. It's money somebody else gets. All right, let's see. A balance, we talked about accruals in the accrual basis. And accrual is just basically the act of recording something that has incurred but hasn't actually been paid out or received payment for. A balance sheet um, is a comparison between all of your assets, equities, and liabilities, cash flow is money coming in and out of your business. Chart of accounts, these are categories you use that you classify transactions. So if you have um, airline tickets from you know, uh, an airline and then you have lodging and then you have um, ground transportation and this, that, and the other thing, um, all of that you would probably report to travel whether you break it out by each individual category, airfare or whatnot. But let's say you have Delta, you have Southwest, and you have American Airlines. Those are all airfare for travel, and that would be the chart of account would be the airfare, um, and, and unless you want to just record it as travel, and that that comes down to a management decision. Cost of goods sold. I like to um, identify this as if you were selling T-shirts as a retail store, um, then the cost of the T-shirts that you purchase in order to sell. That is the cost of the good that you sold. So it's really kind of in the name. So that would be um, your wholesale price for something that you resell. So that's a cost of goods sold. It could also be labor and materials if you're building things or creating something. Let's say um, you were an artist and you were selling um, you know, paintings, then a certain amount of your time, a certain amount of the canvas, certain amount of paints, um, maybe the frame or whatever, if, if it's a traditional painting, um, those would all be things that are included in the cost of goods sold in order to get that um, item uh, sold so that you can make some money. Double entry bookkeeping. Um, so we talked about that. There's always two sides. Um, double entry bookkeeping has debits and they have credits. And for everything that you record, there has to be uh, the same total number of credits as there is debit. So again, it's a balancing system. You can't have um, one that's higher than the other. Otherwise, it doesn't work. It ha they both have to tie out. Um, debits and credits. Each bookkeeping transaction has two sides, so double entry accounting. One side is the debit, and the other side is the credit. Um, assets and expenses are increased by debits and reduced by credits. Income, equity, and liabilities are increased by credits and reduce debits. Um, depreciation is the write down of capital assets. So meaning a capital asset is um, basically a car or a building or something. And a building is not a great example for depreciation. Let's say, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's a large piece of equipment, maybe a print press or something like that. And so the idea is that asset it has value for longer than one period. So you take that asset's cost over a longer period. So for example, uh, a $38,000 vehicle, you can't just deduct $38,000 in one year because that's the year you bought it. You would take that $38,000 over five years. Um, and that's what depreciation means. 
equity and capital. Um, this is interchangeable. Um, you're going to hear a lot of different ways, but basically that is what is owned or owed to um, the shareholder of the business. So equity includes money paid in by the owner contributions, money the owner has earned but not taken from the business, earning retained earnings, and other types of contributions like stocks issued. Um, expenses is money your business spends money on, operations and overhead. So this is a little bit separate from cost of goods sold. So your operating expenses would be like rent, utilities, that kind of stuff. Payroll, all that things. Fixed asset is a capital asset. They include land, buildings, machinery, equipment, and vehicles. Um, fixed expenses. The best way to explain this is rent. So a fixed expense is the same thing you're going to pay regardless of use. So when you rent out a space, it's the same amount of money for rent for the period under the contract or whatever it might be. Um, but it doesn't matter. It's like a gym membership. You're going to pay that $20 a month whether you go in and work out or not. It is a fixed expense. Um, we'll get back to... Um, the other type later. Um, let's see, which is variable and that's at the end. General ledger, we talked about that, is made up of assets, liabilities, equity, income, and expenses. These five account types comprise your books for your business. A journal is a daily business transactions. Um, that's where the daily business transactions are recorded. Therefore, they go into uh, there before they go into the general ledger. Liabilities is what your business owns. That's like a credit card, that's accounts payable, that's your idle loan, um, that's tax liabilities that have not been paid, all of that good thing. So liabilities is, is money that you have to pay to somebody else. Um, income and revenue, that's your sales, that's how much money you earn by selling your products or services. Uh, payroll, pretty self-explanatory, but it's a list of employees and how much you pay each one. Profit is what your business has earned after cost of goods and expenses have been subtracted from income. Profit is not the same as cash on hand. Reconciliation, we talked about that a bit. It's part of your internal controls. The process of verifying the balance of certain accounts, checking credit cards, loans, et cetera, against the statement from an outside source, usually a bank. So basically saying, here's my bank account balance in my books, and then here's what my bank says, and do they drive? Can you tick and tie? Subledger, a ledger containing the details of subset of transactions. A trial balance is a statement that tells you uh, if your debits and credits are accurate before you create financial statements. Then the variable expenses. So we talked about um, fixed expenses, rent. Variable expenses is utilities. So you pay for as much as you use. So that was would be things that are a little bit harder maybe to anticipate. So that's why it's important whenever you're like dealing with cash flows, okay, you know how much you're going to pay out in rent all the time, but um, your hourly employees, well, I mean, you might be able to decide how much time you want them to spend, um, but there's also um, utilities, how much electric, and that's going to change um, over higher rate periods like, uh, you know, uh, July and the summer, that kind of stuff for electricity and cooling, all that fun stuff. So here is your list of terminology to know. Then we're gonna just kind of give you an idea of the financial reports. And so here, this is just a general introduction. If you've never seen it before, hopefully this kind of gives you um, a little bit of a precursor as to what we're gonna end up doing. Um, and we're gonna read this left to right, top to bottom. So the balance sheet is comprised of assets, liabilities, and equity, we talked about that. Accounts receivable and accounts payable aging reports. So these are, for example, if you invoice people and they pay you back later, uh, or not back, they pay you in the first place later, um, then you would have a list of who owes you money and how long that money is outstanding. Um, again, the accounts payable is the reverse. So it's money you owe and who you owe and how long you owe the money. <laughs> so um, both very important reports and for very different reasons. So the accounts receivable will be on the asset section and the accounts payable would be on the liabilities area. Okay, profit and loss is probably what you all are very familiar with. You spend a lot of time in it um, to manage your business and it is comprised of your revenue or your income or your sales, however you wanna call it. Um, so that is, that is your, what, uh, the sales that you do. And then the cost of goods sold, if you have direct costs of uh, selling things, and then you have expenses, which would be operating expenses, which could be fixed or variable. Then we move on to the cash flow statement. And the cash flow statement here is not, we're not talking about a cash flow analysis. 
That is a completely separate in depth course. Um, this actually uh, is, is a financial statement that shows you that here's the monies that came and went out of your business and it identifies the activity around those funds. So how much of money was spent for operations or investments or financing? And that works with cash flows, cash disbursements, cash on hand at the end of the month. And we're gonna jump right into the balance sheet. And again, if you have never seen these financial reports, instead of putting up a bunch of numbers, which I will be doing later on, I'm gonna get to that, but I kind of wanted to start with a visual representation. And so we talked about um, the accounting equation where the total assets equals the total liabilities plus shareholders equity. This physically gives you an idea visually of what that looks like. The total assets um, square is as big and takes up as much room as the total liabilities and shareholders equity. So I kind of like that, that visual representation. And assets are things like bank accounts. We talked about accounts receivable. We talked about fixed assets like the vehicle. Um, other current assets could be, I don't know, you invested in something and somebody owes you money. Maybe you gave another business a loan or something like that. Um, Long-term assets might be, uh, let's say you put your, your money in a CD, that's um, the term of its five years. Well, the, the term current and long-term comes down to a 12-month cycle. So anything longer than 12 months is a long-term. Anything 12 months and shorter is a current term. So when we're talking about assets, you can use a CD. If it's a six-month CD and you can pull your money out in six months, it's a current asset. If it's a five-year CD or money market or whatever it might be, where you can't move the money for longer than um, 12 months, then that's where it would come in. And the same thing holds true on the other side. So like we had accounts receivable, that's money people owe you. Accounts payable is money people you owe. And if you owe the money, then it's a liability. If somebody owes you or you can get money out of it, it's an asset. So accounts payable, credit cards. If you have a line of credit, you have to pay that back. Um, loans and the loans could either be current liabilities or long-term liabilities. So if you took out um, idle loans, the economic injury uh, loans, then that with the SBA is um, like a mortgage. It's like 30 years or something like that. So that would be a long-term loan. So it would live in the long-term section of your balance sheet. And this all comes down to uh, financial viability and, and your position and being able to pay these off. When you look at things like that, um, your current liabilities have to be paid within a certain period of time. Do you have enough cash and leverage to be able to do so? Um, so that's where things like this start coming into play. And that's why it becomes important. Now, the shareholders equity is kind of what's left over. It's, it's what uh, remains at the end of the day. And so a lot of these images um, show around what a corporation's equity section looks like. But if you're a partnership, it's going to look a little different. They're just going to use terms like um, the member's equity as opposed to capital retained earnings. If you're a um, corporation, then you have stock. You may have additional paid in capital. You may have treasury stock, so on and so forth. So there's just um, some, some terminology in there. And as promised, if you were waiting for numbers on paper, here you go. I went to Google Images and found some um, fake uh, financial statements that uh, can show you kind of what it would look like. And I did break this down between the three categories. When you look at this in real life, all of those three categories are pretty much going to be on one page. You'll have one document with assets and the liabilities and the equity. Here I broke it down so it's a little easier to read. So <clears throat> all of your assets. We talked about things that are assets. Inventory is one of them. We didn't even talk about that. The depreciation kind of it is part of your, your fixed assets, your capital assets. And so this is the um, asset section of your balance sheet. It might look a little different. You may have other things in here, um, but, but this is a good example of what it could look like. And liabilities. So in here, this is, you owe somebody something. And so current liabilities versus long-term, right? If you had a mortgage or an idle loan or something long-term, that would be in there. Um, you have accounts payable. Um, if you are on the accrual method of accounting, maybe there are expenses that are owed but not paid. So that would be a, an accrued expense because accrual. Um, unearned revenue is the same thing for accrual. So if, um, 
you have revenue that you're projecting, um, but it's not yet earned. And um, say, you know, somebody gave you a grant, but the grant isn't earned until you spend the grant um, on certain things. So as you spend the grant on those monies, uh, spend those monies for those purposes, then the money becomes earned and things kind of work through. So this is you owe somebody something. Hopefully this is a smaller section than um, your assets uh, financially that puts you in a better position and shareholders equity. So again, this might look different for your company. You might be a sole proprietor. You might be a single member LLC. You might be a partnership. You may have members and not shareholders, but this gives you an idea of what this could look like. So this area is what is what remains in the company or what is the owner's um, ownership in the business effectively. So you have um, here you have payment capital and it tells you between preferred stock and common stock. And you can look all, all these terms up if you like, total paid in capital. You have retained earnings, which is kind of the aggravation over time of what this account kind of works out to. Um, and then there's some treasury stock that's, that's in there. And then it gives you the total uh, stockholders equity, shareholders equity, capital, members equity, so many different names all for the same thing. And the legal structure does change what terminology. And if you're a nonprofit, this uh, is all worded very differently because you don't have equity as a nonprofit because nobody owns a nonprofit. It's very exciting. And then we come back to the accounting equation. Assets equals liabilities plus shareholders equity. Assets is what you own. Liabilities is what you owe. And equity is what you get. So that's kind of a nice um, way to recap the balance sheet. And if I haven't beaten that horse to death, I don't know what else to do. Okay, aging reports. So we talked about accounts receivable and I just like this little cartoon. Um, if an invoice is due in 30 days, we paid in 60. If it's due in 60, then we paid in 90. And if it's due in 90, then they probably didn't need the money anyway. So that's kind of cute. Um, accounts receivable is money owed to you. How old are the outstanding balances? And usually they're in periods of uh, months, typically. So you would have like, these have been outstanding for 30 days. These have been outstanding for 90 days. These have been, or 60 days, 90 days and, and plus. And so it would identify, you know, how um, collectible maybe your receivables are. The older they get, the harder it is to collect money, that kind of stuff. Um, and accounts payable is the exact opposite, but instead of money owed to you, it's money you owe people or businesses. Um, and how old are they? How long have they been holding on? Uh, are you just not paying your bills? That gives you kind of an idea of maybe what a creditor or an investor would look like at this. Um, that could be damaging business relationships. So there's, there's um, financial metrics, metrics based on what's in these parts of, of uh, your accounts but also there's non-financial metrics that um, people will pull from when they look at these numbers. And the AP aging total should be the same amount that is reflected on the balance sheet. It's very exciting. Profit and loss. Okay, here's your non-statement statement here. And the simple profit and loss is revenue minus expenses equals profit and loss. Um, you could have uh, other items in here like cost of goods sold. You could have things that are non-operational like other income and expenses. So uh, we'll just start at the top. So revenue, it's your sales, it's commission, it's how you make your money. You want to call it one thing, it doesn't matter. Um, you, you sold something and um, your customers are going to pay you for it or your clients or whatever you want to call them. Cost of goods sold is the t-shirt, you're, you're selling t-shirts, so you've got to buy the t-shirts at a wholesale price and sell them at retail, so the cost of the shirts, the cost to get the shirts in if you pay um, shipping, and any other direct costs associated with that. Let's say you bedazzle your shirts, you may have glue gun and beads and all of that, and the labor, the cost to associate with that. So um, there's your cost of it sold. Operating expenses is what it um, is required of you, right? To operate your business. So rent is a fixed expense. Advertising is a variable expense. You're gonna pay for what you buy, right? Uh, and how much you use. Payroll could be both if you have salary or hourly employees, depending upon what your arrangements are. Um, office expenses, um, supplies, that kind of stuff, and other similar operating expenses, maybe utilities or, or anything else you can kind of think of to run your business. 
Then we have stuff that kind of lives outside of all of that. Like this has nothing to do with your business, but the fact that you exist, these things happen. So um, if you have a savings account or a money market account or any investment account that's making you money, let's say there's dividend um, income or interest income associated with it, you're not in the business of lending money. So interest income typically for a normal business would be outside the scope of normal operations. So it would land into this other income category. Things like penalties and settlements. For example, if you paid your taxes late and there was a late filing penalty, um, that would go in there. The reason that's important is because um, you shouldn't be incurring these in the first place. I think it's kind of the, the thought process behind it, but more importantly for income taxes, penalties are not deductible. <laughs> <laughs> so, the IRS isn't giving you a tax deduction for them because you shouldn't have paid them in the first place. Um, they're, they're like that. And then other non-operating income and expense items that you can kind of pull in. Um, profit and loss, total revenue, sales income, less cost of goods sold, less operating, plus other income, less other expenses equals whatever your profit and loss is. Again, not how much money is in the bank account. All right. And... Just for good measure, I put numbers on paper. So you are welcome. I went into Google and I found an image of a sample uh, company's profit and loss. And this is something that you could do. Um, you can get into the details of, of these parent-child categories as, as detailed or as non-detailed as you like. Um, getting And the, this, this involves like the chart of accounts. Like, do I want selling expenses and do I want them broken out by advertising and commission? Is that important? Um, do I want to break out the commissions by different commission types and even further break it down the scope? Um, that comes down to uh, a cost benefit analysis of how much information do you actually need versus the cost of getting that level of detail in. So keep it as simple as possible, um, but make sure there's enough detail and enough data for you that your financials are useful and you can make good decisions for them. So this is what a profit and loss looks like. So exciting! <laughs> statement of cash flows. And so here we are, we have the statement of cash flows and basically it summarizes the movement of, movement of cash that goes, uh, comes and goes out of a company. It also highlights the company's ability to manage their cash. So <clears throat> most people, when you hear the statement of cash flows, they're thinking, oh, how much money do I need to make payroll at the end of the month or so on and so forth. So they're literally going in and trying to figure out, well, how much sales are we going to have? How much operating expenses are we going to have? And where are we? So on and so forth. What this is really doing is saying after the fact, money came and went and analyzing what that money did for the business. So was it as a result of operating activities, investing activities, or financing activities? So it is broken down to those three activities. And so operating activities would be money in from sales. Um, and this is backwards. It's kind of contradictory. We said, um, you know, interest is probably not a general operations, but for the statement of cash flow, it is. And that's what it is. Um, cost of goods sold, uh, regular operating expenses, rent utilities, payroll, all of that good stuff. Investing activities is cash from or going out for investing activities, meaning you bought a car, or you have accounts receivable, accounts payable, those kind of things is, is investing. Financing is um, cash from non uh, cash from financing activities, dividends, stock repurchases, payments of debt, um, loans, that kind of thing. So this statement looks like this. And so it's a little different from cash flow projections. Again, that could be a completely different class. Uh, for you guys to go through. So that is something to probably look into, but unfortunately we only have an hour today. <laughs> so we're just giving you kind of a general overview. So in here you can actually see like, okay, it starts out with net income. And the statement of cash flows is a complicated statement. It actually, this could be its own thing um, in terms of training, but there's the direct method and the indirect method. Long story short, you can do this one of two ways. Um, I pulled uh, in, in this method, so net income, depreciation, um, increase in accounts, receivable, decrease in inventory, so on and so forth. And then you work out to the total cash uh, in or out from operating activities, um, again, for investing, finance, all of that stuff. And then it um, circles back to what the cash balance was at the beginning of the period, at the end of the period, and the net change. And the net change breaks down into these categories. Very. 
Okay, ratios. This is um, the most fun portion you'll have of the day. Ratios are things that you're gonna do. So now you have your financial statements, you put everything in, you've got everything you need, and then you're gonna go even further into taking those numbers and having them do something for you. So the uh, break even point, and, and these are basic ratios. There are so many more out there that you will discover as you kind of get more into this. Um, but if people are looking at investing in your company, um, becoming uh, additional ownership in your business maybe, uh, or if people are giving you loans or financing your business, um, these things are gonna come into play and they will be applying them to the numbers you give them based on your reports. So um, these are just some general ones and we'll go through them here. Uh, the break-even point basically is how much do you need to sell to not make anything? <laughs> oh, why would I need to know that? Because then it can kind of give you some, some further insights. And so because this actually includes um, what's called the growth, gross profit margin, um, on the right-hand side in the middle, I have also included the gross margin. So we'll go through that um, as we go. So the break-even point is a point uh, where the income for the sale of goods or services equals the total cost. So you do the variable plus fixed expenses, so that's your fixed cost. Um, uh, and then fixed costs, let's see. I have this written down kind of weird. I'm sorry, my notes are weird. So your fix, fixed cost divided by your profit margin. Um, so that gives you the break-even point on the ratio. Um, the current ratio, which is down below it, measures the liquidity of the business, its ability to meet its current ob obligations, excuse me, those um, due during the course of the year, current assets divided by current liabilities. Um, debt to equity ratio evaluates the company's leverage, ability of the shareholder to cover all outstanding debts in the event of a business downturn, total liabilities divided by total shareholders' equity. Then we have retained on earnings which is also the quick ratio. And it's also called the acid ratio it's, or the acid test. And that's an indicator of the company's short-term liquidity uh, position, measures a company's ability to meet its short-term obligations with its most liquid assets. So um, basically this is current assets minus um, inventory divided by current liabilities. And um, we have return on equity. Uh, measure a, of the, a measure of financial performance, net income divided by average shareholders' equity. And then we have working capital, which represents a company's ability to pay its current liabilities with its current assets. So you would take your current assets minus your current liabilities, and that is your working capital. So that is what we have for the ratios. And like I said, when you start going in and looking at this a little bit further, you're going to find more ratios. And depending upon who you're working with and what you're doing, um, that provides you with um, a little bit more um, in detail as to what ratios you need and what they really mean. When, when you're working with stuff like this, this is like pie in the sky ideas. But when you start working with the numbers that you have lived and spent money on, um, those numbers become very real and very important, um, especially when the... Um, the health of your business is, is on the line and, and potentially your ability to continue. So uh, these can be very important. So those are your ratios. And we're about 15 minutes out and we have time for questions. So I'm going to bring Anna back for uh, the Q&A portion to get us the questions that you guys have brought in. And we are more than happy um, to go ahead and uh, have you guys uh, get your questions answered. Yeah, Amanda, I see two questions. Um, so the first is, I understand gross receipts, taxes, or a liability, but what about the fees such as the filing for a corporation? So um, the fees to file for a corporation, so let's say you incorporate with a secretary of state or you um, register as an LLC or um, a partnership or whatever uh, organization. So there's like fees. So, so if you become an LLC, I know for a fact that that's $50. Um, that is not a liability because you pay that kind of when it's due. You can't be a business without paying that. So it's not something that's owed down the road. 
Um, and if you're a corporation, the fees are incurred, I think, annually that you have to pay. If you're a single member LLC, I do not believe that there are, I think it's a one time um, setup dollar amount. Um, and the gross receipts are a liability only in the regard that. Um, they are incurred but not owed until whenever you're required to file and pay, and the state determines that based on how much you owe each period. So once you hit um, having a tax liability of $200 or more, then you become a monthly filer, and it, uh, you, you can file more infrequently um, the fewer tax dollars you are owed. So if you're a semi-annual filer, then January through June are gross receipts that you've collected and you have to pay the state, but you may not be paying them until July, right? So um, yeah, that is exactly how that would work. If that answers that. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And then we've got another question. What do you call money that you personally put into the business? So this is, um, again, it's it, the, the way you structure your business is um, gonna determine what term you use, <laughs> but let's say you're a single member LLC. That's the easiest one right here. And let's say you needed to put money into the business to pay for payroll or operating expenses or whatever. And so that money would be called an owner contribution typically. And if you take money out of the business as an LLC, it would be an owner distribution or an owner draw. If um, you're a corporation, it might be um, a loan to or from the business uh, to the business for, to or from the shareholder, whether you owe them your business money or whether they owe you money back. Um, it could be considered a dividend. And so all of these things may or may not have tax implications. So how you move money in and out of your business would be a great item to discuss with whoever's helping you with your taxes if you have a paid preparer. Um, but honestly, um, at the end of the day, uh, it really depends on the corporate structure, and and if you're if you're C, uh, an S corporation, a small business status corporation, um, you cannot pay yourself um, out. Not you have to have payroll. I mean, you can take distributions and, and dividends, but you are required to be on payroll and pay payroll taxes and file payroll reports and W twos, and so your corporate structure really impacts how and the nature and the taxability of what's paid if there's any. Thanks so much for that, Amanda. I really appreciate it. Um, if you have any other questions on any of the attendees, you can also feel free to raise your hand and I can unmute you if you'd prefer to just uh, speak with us directly. And by us, I mean Amanda, since she's the expert here. Um, so go ahead and do that. And then also just wanted to let you know that I chatted through links and some information. We've recently become aware that those links are difficult to copy and paste. So please know that we will send a follow-up email to let you know um, all this information so you have it handy for you there. So don't feel like you need to jot this down or try and copy and paste, even though it probably won't work. But um, yeah, that's that's it on my end. Um, Amanda, if you have anything that you uh, want to kind of say to wrap things up, or um, it looks like we have a little bit of additional time, so I don't know if you wanted to go over something. No pressure to do so, of course, but I'll just hand it back over to you and I'll let you know if I see any raised hands. All right, well, um, yeah, I would say if, if you have questions, let us know. We are more than happy to be a, a good little family here and, and it's very casual and I don't like. Um, and there are no bad questions because uh, we're all learning here. Um, but what I would uh, probably go over is maybe um, business resources for you for additional trainings. Um, the SBDC has great vast resources. Um, I know the links are a little troublesome, but I believe they'll be followed up with some emails so that you can get those uh, separately as well. You will be receiving a copy of this PowerPoint so you can go and look at things. I know we went through things kind of fast, um, but we only have an hour and I'm trying to fit all of the information that you could possibly use into one, um, one, one class here. And then um, what I would also say is that there are other resources out there. Uh, the SBDC has great resources, SCORE, S-C-O-R-E, has great resources, uh, low cost, no cost, uh, trainings and mentoring and coaching, WEST, W-E-S-S-T, has all of those great resources as well. Uh, the SBA has uh, various resources, and the state, um, 
B, it, though they do tend to hide it under a rock a little bit, there's a lot of resources information available for um, small businesses uh, in the state as well. And um, trying to think of other great resources, you can probably get additional training, um, low cost training. Uh, so some accounting and bookkeeping courses also through CNM, which might be a good resource for you as well. So um, just to know that, that there's plenty of, of, of places to reach. Um, I know QuickBooks Online has um, a good platform that's uh, reasonably intuitive and they have YouTube channels. So if you don't know how to do something in QuickBooks, uh, it will typically help you out. Um, but to also maybe utilize um, the list of resources uh, for preferred um, referrals like vendors like myself, if you need help with bookkeeping or vendors like a CPA who would do maybe your taxes or maybe an attorney. So make sure that um, try to identify the areas where um, spending some money on somebody who will help you in a, in a major way. Um, honestly, one of the places that you can get hooked up with is um, signing a contract or a lease and not having an attorney um, that, is, that is your advocate looking over it for you to make sure that you A, understand what's in it and B, um, know what to do if, if something kind of goes sideways on that. So um, yeah, I think following up with, with the training and resources, I'm trying to think of if there's anything that I didn't really cover that we have. In here, I think we're at. Um, yeah, and the end worries there, Amanda, too. I think um, just, you know, reminding everyone of the resources that are available is, is great. So thank you for that. And um, yeah, just want to remind you, too, that the New Mexico Small Business Development Center has 19 centers within New Mexico. We have a procurement technical assistance center, an international business accelerator, and a technology commercialization accelerator program. Lots of tongue twisters today. And we are here to help you during any stage of the business. So we can really, um, you know, kind of help you out. Don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, definitely take a look at the follow-up email that we'll send. And um, we do offer no-cost free counseling services. So don't hesitate to reach out. And hopefully we can get you in touch, help you out however you um, is necessary or however we can be of help. And um, yeah, don't uh, don't be afraid to take advantage of all the wonderful resources that are out there for you. So um, I think that being said, I don't see any- We have two more questions. Oh, we do, do we? Yes, okay. we do. And one of them, I think um, you are best suited to answer. How can I get a business consultation? Yes, thank you so much for answering that, uh, for asking that. So what um, what we'll do is we will email you our contact information. I would send it through in the chat, but again, you're going to have a hard time copying and pasting it. So just keep an eye out for that email and you can sign up for consultations with local centers here in New Mexico. Thank you so much. And yeah, if you have any questions, um, feel free to send me a follow-up email. That'll also be in the email that we send you and I can get you set up with someone. So um now it looks like the second question, as the owner, do you have to pay yourself? Um, and, and that again goes to how you're set up. If you are set up as a sole proprietor or a single member LLC or a partnership or a corporation, um, it really kind of depends. So if you're an S corporation, you are required to pay yourself. Uh, you're required to pay yourself through salary. As a single member LLC, you are not allowed to pay yourself salary, you would have to go through um, an owner draw or a distribution, um, which you can do, and there's no tax consequences when it comes to that. Um, but there's other ways that a business owner could get paid. So if uh, you have a partnership, um, you could have what's called a guaranteed payment. And a guaranteed payment would be taxed just like um, salaries. So um, depending upon your business structure and how the payment kind of is design the purpose of the payment really um, could decide or determine whether you have taxes to pay on that money you take out. As a single member LLC, the money can come and go, and it's really just you putting money in or taking it out. And there's really no tax cuts. There's no benefit to paying yourself, and there's no um, there's no taxability on the income you take out. So it's like it goes both ways. Um, so if you get, uh, as a general rule, if you get to deduct what you pay yourself against taxable income, then um, that then becomes taxable income somewhere else. So if it's payroll, you would pay payroll taxes on it, so forth. So um, yeah, it, uh, unfortunately, this is a it depends kind of moment, but there are lots of different ways. And if you're not sure, I would say um, talking with a 
a CPA or a tax preparer to identify what's the best course of action before you take that. Thanks so much, Amanda. I don't see any uh, other questions or anybody's hands that are raised. So I guess at this stage, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Um, you know, as always, thank you so much for your expertise, your time, greatly appreciated. And everyone else, thank you for your attendance. Um, again, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We're here to help you. And uh, yeah, appreciate each and every one of you. And thanks again, Amanda. Have a yes, great thanks. afternoon. Thank you all.